From the topic of this next session, I'm probably going to give my age away. Uh, I like the uh, Let's Make a Deal program with Monty Hall. What's behind door one, two, or three? Take your guess. Um, I was talking to our moderator, who I'm going to introduce shortly, Dr. Avi Spear. And uh, I thought maybe I would be a little bit too aggressive here with this suggested title, and Avi just went right with it. No problem, Ken. Um, I am very pleased that Avi could make it. He's come a long, long way for us. He's based in San Diego, and I'm delighted that he brought some good weather with him. So Avi is currently the Director of Strategic Alliances for Novartis Institutes of Biomedical Research. He was educated in biological sciences at Oxford University, receiving his PhD in molecular neuroscience from Cambridge University at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, and trained as a postdoc at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla, California, in the laboratory of Dr. Gregor Sutcliffe. Avi co-founded Allon Therapeutics and led that peptide therapeutic neurodegenerative disease-focused company as its president and CEO through two rounds of financing until listing on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Quite an achievement, I might add. In 2004, Avi joined the Genomics Institute of Novartis' Research Foundation, a 600-plus person biomedical research institute within the Novartis Institutes of Biomedical Research as its director of business development. Avi was recently appointed Director of Strategic Alliances as NIBR with responsibility for search and evaluation activities for the Global Discovery Chemistry, Center for Proteomic Chemistry, and GNF organizations. Um, if you don't thank Avi for this, uh, you can also thank him for the wonderful weather. I'm going to continue to blame him for the wonderful weather. Uh, Avi, it is now my pleasure. Uh, to introduce you, please join me in welcoming Dr. Avi Speer. Avi? That's good. That's good. <clears throat> well, uh, that was quite an introduction, so uh, thank you very much, Kenny. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, uh, when, when I got the call, it was uh, a, and the invitation to, to come and present at this, uh, I think, very important meeting. Um, to me, it was uh, an instant decision. Uh, almost a reflex, uh, sort of came back and said, yes, uh, when do we start, uh, you know, who's coming on the panel, how do, how do we set this up? Um, I, I, you know, as Kenny mentioned, um, I have been an entrepreneur, um, came through the, uh, the ranks of the uh, scientific training uh, in the UK and, uh, and postdoc in the US. And, um, you know, I think uh, having been an entrepreneur, um, starting up a, a, a peptide-based uh, therapeutics-focused company, in San Diego uh, as, a, as a young uh, scientist stroke um, businessman. Uh, I, I received a lot of advice along the way and uh, interacted with many different groups, organizations, came to this kind of meeting and, um, uh, and networked and discussed and uh, talked about how do you do these opportunities, how do you make these things happen. Um, uh, at any given stage, you're walking into the unknown, uh, talking to people who've been there before has been really helpful and uh, definitely influenced uh, me in creating the company that, uh, that I started called Allon Therapeutics. Um, so uh, sort of 10 years later, uh, when the question is, you know, so would you like to talk to uh, entrepreneurial uh, scientists and chemists uh, who are thinking of starting businesses and they're evaluating the different routes and paths that they can take in, in progressing the science and progressing the business opportunity and innovation, um, you know, of course, uh, you know, I'll, I'll always do what I can to, um, to help. And uh, navigating, now I'm in a, a position of in-licensing in a pharma company, I think navigating that process is, uh, you know, if, if you haven't done it before many times, it, it's, uh, it's complex and uh, sort of, it's, it's, it's um, it, you know, it's not clear uh, to some people. So I really wanted to uh, focus this panel on sort of what does, what's it like to interact with a pharma company? How do you get a deal done uh, with a pharma company? Uh, what are the kinds of people that you interact with? What are their missions? What are their um, uh, uh, sort of uh, what are they held accountable for? Uh, and uh, the kind of issues that we're dealing with from a pharmaceutical company basis 
uh, what are we wrestling with? I mean, clearly there's a, you know, an innovation gap. Uh, we need more products. We need better technologies to discover drugs uh, and develop drugs that uh, sort of treat a serious unmet medical need. Um, and uh, you know, our industry is in a sort of somewhat, I guess, contracting uh, position right now. I think. Uh, being a scientist, I'm not a you know an, an economist, but um, I think it's clear to see from the, the news and etc. that uh, you know we need more products to basically expand our industry, uh, create more jobs, and be able to treat more diseases and uh, advance the science of uh, of healthcare. So um, to do that, of course, um, pharma companies realise the need to reach out to the external community uh, and tap into innovation wherever it may be. And we, all of the pharma companies have organizations um, set up to basically uh, specialize in accessing that innovation, bringing it in to our organizations and being able to uh, advance the science with the external partner um, or advance the technology if it's just an asset acquisition and uh, bring that to patients. So that's, that's what my role is in, in Novartis. Um, I am responsible for uh, chemistry platforms in licensing. So uh, that typically in, 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 in Novartis, um, uh, um, sort of the, the lexicon we use, that sort of research technologies um, that help with drug, dis uh, drug discovery. And uh, um, for example, one of, the mo one of the notable deals that we did uh, last year was with a company based in Japan called Peptidream. Um, this company uh, specializes in making large libraries, 10 to the 9 molecules of uh, um, small cyclic peptides um, that can have constrained structures and uh, use unnatural amino acids to basically give these uh, macrocycles the ability to potentially get into cells and address um, targets, target opportunities such as proteins interacting with other proteins that small molecules uh, can't really uh, address and biologics such as antibodies can't really get into cells. Uh, so th there's a big target class of proteins interacting with proteins that we would like to address. Um, and uh, so in one example is Peptidream, it's a platform company uh, that uh, we basically access their innovations and we're, we're using that now in Novartis. So I just wanted to sort of make some opening remarks um, about sort of what I do. But um, we have uh, a terrific panel here. It's an honor to be on the stage uh, with, uh, with Magid uh, Abu Gabia and uh, Mike O'Brien, uh, and I would not be able to do their amazing careers justice by introducing them myself with their bios, so I'm actually going to sort of hand it over to, to them to actually introduce themselves and in the same way that I did, um, sort of just explain a little bit about what it is that they do to give you uh, an indication uh, of sort of what, what, what they're up to and, and what they have to, uh, to contribute to this panel. Um, so Maggie, would you like to, sure. to kick off? Hi, good morning. I'm Magid Abu Garbia, and uh, I'm professor and associate dean of research at Temple University, and also director of Mulder Center for Drug Discovery. Uh, prior joining Temple back in five years ago, I was a senior vice president at Wyeth Pharmaceutical, where I was responsible for actually uh, 500 scientists and big operation in India. Uh, when I joined the uh, Temp Temple University, I was actually among the few where I would you call myself, I work for Wyeth Pharmaceutical, my first and only employer, because I worked for 26 years. Now it's uh, including even my daughters. I mean, they graduated five, seven years ago. They are in the third job or so. So it's, we know how the economy is. So uh, uh, I want to just mention about uh, things about entrepreneurial Actually, to many of our surprises in university, they by nature of the, when you, they hire a faculty, you become on the first road of being entrepreneurial. Why? Because every faculty, when they come, they give you seed money. I mean, and many universities compete to get good people by saying, I'll give this guy a quarter million, I'll give you a million to start your research and so on. Same thing happened with me. I had seed money and that's why the name Mulder Center. And I'm pleased after five years, that seed money was multiplied by 25, brought to the, the, the center and the university. Uh, for my earlier experience, I was blessed that I have 
really inspiring mentors and a very good talented team work with me. So we're able to contribute to discovery and development of eight market drug. And uh, I was very blessed with that team. We put together a similar team, uh, of course, with the scales. And uh, when I started, uh, I used to be uh, actually in an office and I have a few boxes and my wife would always laugh and say, he's a director of a virtual center over a few boxes. Now actually we have about 19 people and we have 10 labs. And we actually among the very few fully integrated drug discovery center within academia. You hear a lot of people say, oh, drug discovery in this university, drug discovery. But actually, we're talking about the capabilities and function which you take the area from the beginning until you decide to go to clinical trials. And we build that in our center. We can actually, uh, if we have a partner, we can make sure that the lead compound we get, they are druggable, friendly. If you treat diseases in the brain, they cross blood-brain barrier if they are not metabolized. So we're among the few who put a very good in vitro ADME panel and also in vivo ADME panel. And many university, even people working in medical school, they really don't do this. As far as entrepreneurial and will come through the session, actually, uh, since the university does not hire people like industry, when I hire someone, he has one year contract. And I tell them that. I said, look, it's one year contract, but believe me, you will be with us. So the people I hire when I came in, they're going into their six years. Because we not only do the grant work, the academic mission, but also we do, I introduced a temple, as you heard yesterday from Steve Nappy, what we call contract research and fee for service. Believe it or not, I have companies in India having contract with us because we help them in managing their projects. It's called project management. Because from our experience, when they work with a US company, the company always asks them, do you have any site in the US? So I reach an agreement, they can say, yes, we work with the Mulder Center, and I have one of my team on the conference call, weekly or bi-weekly, and managing the project. It's their project. And as a result, we get actually good fees, which keep my guys gainfully employed, but also, they benefit because people who work with the company double the number of FTE. And I know a couple of cases where we help them doing that. So throughout the day, we'll talk to you about how you can get business development contract, how you can do all this. And uh, believe me, it wasn't easy, but we can get our agreement done in 48 hours now. Good morning. I'm, I'm, my name is Michael O'Brien, and uh, very, very happy to be here. Um, I, I, a couple of things right at the beginning. I, I certainly didn't uh, plan a career when I came out of college uh, with a goal to be an entrepreneur, or for that matter, even to, to be in any kind of management. Um, I think my prime focus when I came out of college was to try to pay off my college debts. <laughs> um, actually, I was a high school science teacher for a couple of years before I went back to grad school. I got a PhD in synthetic uh, organic chemistry, throw in a little bit of uh, organometallic chemistry just for uh, good measure. And then I went to a company called Hercules Incorporated down in Wilmington, Delaware. And actually, I, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and I've kind of migrated up the East Coast. I'm in Groton right now. Probably figure I'll be up in Canada before you know it. I, I hope not. My wife hoped not. But, but in any event, I was at Hercules, spent uh, three years there, um, and was doing a wide array of things. And one of the reasons I took the job was because of the excitement relative to the applications of the chemistry. We were looking at designing uh, nonlinear optical, polymerizable nonlinear optical chromophores uh, for optical computing. We were looking at designing polymerizable dyes for ferro -li ferroelectric liquid crystal displays. Um, and we were actually working on designing impermeable uh, membranes for um, large rocket motors. Uh, so I did, for a couple of years, I was allowed to say that I was a rocket scientist and I really wasn't lying. Um, but in any event, <laughs> There was an entrepreneurial piece there. And it's the first time I got exposed to this. So the things that we were doing, if the company didn't buy up the project, the group had an opportunity to then take that out and see if somebody else was interested in buying it up. Now, I wasn't really necessarily involved with that. I was a scientist in the lab trying to make the stuff happen. Um, but you were exposed to it, and certainly I filed that back for another day. Um, eventually, they, after about three years, 
they were going to dial back their research by, you know, 70 percent. That didn't seem like a good omen, so I, I moved into uh, the pharmaceutical business uh, at a company called Rome Palant Roar. And there I thought I could just, you know, live for life and synthesize molecules and everything would be good and grand. Um, and it, it has been for quite a while. Eventually, Rome Palant Roar was bought by Aventus. I stayed there, became the uh, head of uh, U.S. research, which um, sounds impressive, except there were only 30 people in the group. It was really a European-dominated company. And then I moved over to Wyeth to take on the head of a synthesis research and development group in chemical development. So at this point in time, my career has kind of migrated more as a uh, um, scientist, uh, scientist with some responsibilities, and then, and then management, a little bit of entrepreneurial things thrown in kind of early on, but then filed in the back of my brain, you know, never to be found again, I guess. Uh, at least that's what I was thinking. And then, of course, uh, and this is a big inflection point for me, um, Pfizer bought Wyeth. And when, when Pfizer bought Wyeth, um, a lot of the, so, so what I did, which would have been to maybe be the head of chemical development or something of that nature, they had their people, and that wasn't going to happen. So an opportunity opened up to head up a, a new group that they had created called Technology and Innovation, which is the role I'm in currently. Um, I've been in this role for three years. Uh, I would say it's the most exciting job, uh, the most rewarding job I've ever had to date. A um, little bit of sampling of what we do. Under, underneath me, I've got eight people. But there's probably two or three hundred people that we matrix with, including in the outside world. There's a business development component to the group, um, or, or we could call it an external, external development component to the group. Um, we have subject matter experts in all the disciplines in pharmaceutical sciences. So the technology and innovation group um, is actually a group that reports into the head of pharma sciences. So that's analytical chemistry, uh, chemistry, drug, drug product development, drug product uh, um, supply, global, global clinical supply, and GCMC regulatory. So it's kind of a hodgepodge of, of activities. And we liaise into all those groups. We're involved, we also have an informatics piece, so we do have the luxury of trying to bring our technology strategy and our, and our information data um, uh, strategies kind of together such that we can maximize the synergies. So a lot of the things we're doing in technology absolutely needs an informatics strategy associated with it. But primarily now, the thing that we're trying to do is help develop uh, Pfizer's uh, Horizon 3, Horizon 2 technology strategy. You know, so we have to create a vision. Where are we going to be in, in, in five years, seven years, eight years? Um, or where do we need to be? And if we need to be there, what do we need to do to get there? Um, we do a lot of trying to develop external networks, setting up uh, consortia, either with other companies, uh, with academia, with academia and other pharma companies. We're doing a lot of work now outside of the pharma space, um, particularly in the area of competitive intelligence, trying to take advantage of. There are things that the food industry has been doing for 20 years or that uh, aerospace has been doing for 15. And I think as a kind of in general, the pharma companies have tended to uh, ignore some of that stuff. So we're trying to do a much better job of trying to uh, learn from others. Um, and so, it, so, so in general, it, it, it's bringing these relationships together uh, with a focus on some sort of a, a, a big deliverable. We do have an incubation program that we're, we do finance, so we don't have all the money in the world, actually. Um, I heard, well, some of my people think we do, but we don't. <laughs> but um, Mag had mentioned the multiplier effect. So one of, my, one of our group's biggest roles is to multiply dollars and resources. So we may incubate small assets um, that we are looking forward to. That could be a, a ticket into something that might be much bigger and have much a, more of a global impact, both for pharma and for ourselves. We are trying to move away from everything's about us, Pfizer, and I know that it's hard to believe, but we are actually, because what's good for pharma is probably good for Pfizer, and that's you know, very important to us. Um, and anyways, we leverage these assets to try to grow something much bigger. And that asset can be a small, it could be money, it could be a combination of money and the asset itself. And then as we develop things um, and move them into bigger projects, those projects kind of move on, and we're continuing to develop smaller things in other areas or other arenas. That keeps our scientists engaged, and at the same time, you know, gives us some leverage in terms of, of being involved with uh, cutting edge technology development and taking a leadership role in certain things. So th that's a bit of how we operate. Um, you know, the, the role is really, I, you have to wear a lot of different hats and it, I would say it's a, uh, I don't know that I would consider myself an entrepreneur at this point, but the things that the group is doing is, are definitely entrepreneurial in nature. So again, thanks for having me here. Thanks, gentlemen. Um, so uh, as the moderator of this um, panel, I have the luxury of um, setting the ground rules. And um, 
we, as, uh, as uh, this group, um, discussed this, and we, we basically said we're not going to be speakers, that you guys are not going to be the audience. Um, we're all going to be participants in a discussion. So, um, you know, I, you know I'm, a, I'm the licensing specialist for chemistry technologies for Novartis, um, one of the largest, uh, probably the biggest research spending company, I believe, uh, in, uh, in the pharmaceutical sector. Uh, you have Mike, head of innovation for pharmaceutical sciences at, at Pfizer, and Magid, who is uh, basically a drug discovery leader from Wyeth, um, now uh, working in academic innovation at Temple University, uh, a massive wealth of experience. And we, we don't want to guess where you want this conversation to go, so we're going to throw it sort of right out to you guys and, and let that come through. But try and make your question sort of of a general interest and not uh, specific to your project, if, if you will. Let's go ahead. Hi, Melinda Toomey, Jayhawk Biotech. I wondered if anyone had some advice on a biotech company that has some basic building blocks of new technology that could be used to make a new therapeutic or even biological follow-ons. Um, and I don't think that some of the uh, pathways for FDA approval is really clear um, for the like generic biological drugs. And I'd like to know what you guys um, see happening in the near future. Do you so when you're talking about building blocks, I mean, you uh, provide this as for your company as a as a fee-for-service people buy them or you use that to come into drug candidate because I can give you advice based on so you have have them available for researcher um, this is more like a new way to make protein or maybe a new way to study a protein things that are not already in okay. FDA approved um, procedures does that make sense and so they would be a new part of the approval package Okay, you remind me of the company in uh, Germany where approach us, uh, and the company is doing actually some of these uh, protein recumbent protein and others, and they want to expand. So you have, I, I see two options for this. I mean, basically, when when you interact with partner who need your tools and technology, then that would bring you some money and cash and things, but not really beyond that. Or if you want to take this further into to drug candidate, you need to collaborate or partner with a group who really can take this protein, develop them into assay, then find a lead compound, and then they do optimization and take this, and then maybe partner with Novartis or with Pfizer and others. So I would say, because you probably won't have the entire infrastructure except for the early phase, which is the target. And so you need actually to partner, and I'm not saying this to, to bring business to us, with a group like our group or other group and so on, and that can bring you to the next level of entrepreneurial where you will have something for a company to come and pay you or to do investment. You have to have an IP. And in order to have that, most likely, and many physicians and biologists confuse that when they say, Oh, I have or I can form a company. You can't sell a target, put it in a bottle and sell it. It has to be a drug candidate, a chemical or protein therapeutics. And that's what brings you the partner and so on. So that's I would add my advice. There are a lot of those sort of potential partner available. And maybe you can discuss this with your business team, business plan, and you can proceed that way. A, a, a general just comment that uh, so one of the things I heard in the question was and this could be general for everybody is so if, if I have something that's that's some sort of an asset um, you know whether it be you know, biotech or whether it be some you know novel technology or a new assay or whatever um, how, how do I get it out there to, to, to sort of find out you know who might be interested um, in helping me to drive this to to some other horizon one thing I would suggest is most pharma companies, most of the big ones, will have an external facing page um, that, it, and we do, I know Merck does, um, where literally we put out there, this, these are our various technology strategies internally, and these are the types of things we're looking for um, from people anywhere in the world. It's a good first place to start because 
you know, one may find, whoa, they're looking for exactly what I happen to be developing. And then that's a great place to start because it'll also give you a contact person. That's just a thought. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to just riff on that to make it more of a generalized uh, question and uh, sort of more about sort of how do you approach a pharma company? We're massive organizations with 100,000 folks or more in, in, our, in our ranks, um, and you have a very specific technology. You'd like to see where does this fit in? Is this of, of use? And, you know, we're global organizations. Maybe it fits in in Croatia but not in, you know, California. How do you, how do you access that information? So. Um, you know, I think, uh, Mike, I might, I mean, you, you brought up one sort of point about sort of we have our, our web portals and they work. Uh, I will get to see um, your opportunity if you bring it up. It's in, it sounds like it's a new chemical matter, um, not peptides, not biologics, not low molecular weight. That'll come to me um, and I will review it with the chemistry leadership team biologic leadership team, if it really is a, in a gap, um, we, you know, we'll have to work out what to do with it. But we'll also have to work out, is that useful to us? Um, and, and, and you'd have to present that to us. Um, so, I mean, Mike, would you like to sort of comment more about sort of other ways that um, entrepreneurs can approach uh, pharma companies and have their ideas reviewed? Well, I, so going back to the, um, the external page. It, it, in this case, it's actually a brochure that we put out. I think Merck actually put out a video um, to, together with a webinar and, 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 and such. And in, in those um, communication um, vehicles, there will be contact persons like, like Avi, or um, if you're looking at uh, manufacturing technologies, there'll be a contact person. So it's, it's a quick way to find somebody that you can talk to that can serve as, uh, uh, as a transom. Um, but yeah, truthfully, other places are, are, are meetings. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've hooked somebody up to somebody else in my company just at a conference or a meeting of almost any sort. Um, I, you know, so I, I think the more you get out there and the more you talk to people, the more you come away with, with contacts. And the more people hear about you, you know, the more word of mouth, uh, or via word of mouth, uh, people will hear about it. Another question? Yes, uh, Victor McCrary, Morgan State University. University and industry relationships go way, ba way, way back. However, in this time, because the funding side for the universities, the picture has drastically changed. The innovation side for the companies have drastically changed. Advice in 2013 and beyond for how universities ought to interact with companies uh, particularly starting from your VPs for research all the way down to the faculty level, because it is a reset. Thank you, I'll, I'll throw that to you first. Well, I mean, uh, what's really stifled collaboration between academic and industry, to be honest, are the technology transfer and business development people, in particular in university. I want to be, I want to be honest. I tell you because you, they, they always overvalued their, 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 their so-called asset, and there will be no asset sometime. And I tell you, I mean, I, I was working in a, in a project when I was at Wyeth, and I'm heading a natural product group where we're isolated from a famous product people know called Premarin. We isolated almost maybe 40, 50 components, and we try to prevent generic, of course, and others, and, so there was some steroids, and I figured, well, you know, we isolated that. Let's try to scale it up so we can test it. I sent to colleagues in a southern state, and I got the tech transfer, send the, the thing back, say that they're going to do this and this, and they will own this, and they will own this. And, they, and so I called the guy. I said, own what? I mean, you think the, the company going to let you own that component? I'm, you got to be kidding me. So what we did, I told our scale-up group, and they made it internally. So here is the things where, as example, hands-on when I was in farm. Now, when I came to Temple, very first agreement, and I, and I really share with you, on, and also, as, uh, as President Clinton used to say, I feel for you, about the grants. No, really, because the grant situation is terrible. 
I was just on the phone yesterday with an SPR company who wanted me to cut the budget I put and almost by half, and I said, you got to be kidding me. He said, well, because they ask us, the subcontract shouldn't increase more than 40% and get, which I know that. So, but anyway, so what we did, we said, we're going to do contract research. If you, as a, the colleague who asked the question, come to us, we can give you two scenarios. We can help you move your things so and so, it cost you this much, or we can be partner, shared risk, shared reward. There are several avenue for entrepreneurial. And when I came to Temple, this was like something new where you said, what do you mean? Because somebody actually was asking me from Medical School University of Cincinnati about compound. And he said, it's very good in doing this and this and this. And we signed the confidentiality. And so I called him back. I said, which compound? He said, well, the one. I said, that's a mixture of two. And so the guy was, and I was just one hour, month in the office. And I said, guess what? I can s separate this for you and give you the two things, and it cost you $10,000. So when the dean heard this, he said, what are you doing here? And I said, look, I have this guy I hired, and he needs to go to conference, ACS, and these things. How are we going to pay for his trip? <laughs> and so on. So actually, we talked to the tech transfer. And so the earlier provost, and she was really supportive of us, I said, what do you care? You care about university overhead? I'll bring you university overhead. So we actually made an agreement, and now we can do contract research, and we add to that university overhead, and so on. So I think the tech transfer has to be educational. I went and gave lecture at USC, and uh, my colleague who invited me, I was surprised because they have a round table with tech transfer and some of the MDs, and, and they were talking about how things has been done at the Mulder and at Temple, and, which was flattering. And I explained to them, the first deal I made was a Swedish company. And if you go to our website, you will see we work with a company called Cortendo. We take this project from A to Z. It's as if, if Avi or, or these guys or what I did in the past, make the protein, make the assay, make the compound, do all these things, and then here is the agreement. And so that took six month to get it signed by the university. Six months. Now, the fastest, 48 hours. Because there are ways you talk to your group and tell them, and this is what we did, what terms you like to see? And I sat with the chief counsel, and, and he was, I said, how about if we reach a template for having CDA, MTA, MOU, and this, and we actually arm wrestled and we got this template. I take the template, I'll send it to the partner. He will come and correct it, track changes. I give it back to the lawyer. He will finish it in a couple of days. So the tech transfer is very important to really these are the stifling with academia and industry. So from the pharma point of view, uh, Mike, uh, I know Pfizer, um, certainly in the press, has been making some very innovative moves in how it interfaces with academics um, to, I guess, enhance its uh, pipeline of technologies and development. Do you, do you care to comment on a, a few of those initiatives? Yeah, I'll start off with, well, so first of all, you know, one comment I heard um, in, in the uh, question was, was faculty. And I think one of the things we don't want to lose sight of at university, and I think Maggot uh, reiterated this, is, you know, one of our prime purposes is education. Um, and of course, when you're getting a graduate degree, you're still trying to educate the student, but you're also trying to do some sort of basic or meaningful research, and, and there's an uh, uh, um, integration of those two, because someday that graduate student's not going to be a graduate student, and he has to get a job, and there has to be some sense of what's going on in the outside world. So that, uh, that's where the academic uh, um, and university um, I'm sorry, the academic and, and, and industry sort of can come together hand in hand. Um, if you think of academics and you think of uh, university, you have access to NIH funding, you have access to NSF funding. Um, you get some of the brightest upcoming future scientists in the world uh, that, that are fresh with new ideas. And in some cases, they don't have the prejudice and the biases that, that keep them from seeking you know, new and better things. So we need to tap into that better, and I'm going to get to the how. The how. Um, and, and the same thing with, with uh, academia. In, in academia and in, in, uh, in university, if you can find application for the basic research, meaningful application, that's powerful. 
That's very powerful. Now, I'll give you an example where, so let's take precious metal catalysis, all right? There's just so much out there. However, much of it is under patent by, you know, companies or by, by uh, uh, scientists who have, you know, invented things and, you know, now we have payroll rights and whatnot. Well, one thing, we're, we're, the, the earth is being depleted of these catalysts, you know, of the metals, the precious metals, that's an issue. And another is that if we want, need to use one or, or a particular ligand or something in, in a bulk quantity, we can't afford it. So we've got to wipe it out of the process and do something different. And sometimes that's not actually good for, for the environment or whatever. So we're setting up what we call a Pfizer Institute for um, looking to find a replacement for precious metal catalysts. So how, how about iron? How about zirconium? How about, you know, different metals and using them in non-traditional reactions where you'd normally use palladium, platinum, and everything, those kinds of things. Now, we've got three leading academic institutions involved, and there's three major pharma companies plus ourselves. We're all contributing into the pool. Now, one of the things it's going to avoid is for, we're not going to dump money into a professor to do something that he can get an NIH grant for. He's going to pull that money from NIH, but we're going to support overall students and some other things. So there's a real scratch my back, I'll scratch yours kind of uh, cooperation going on here. And the slight difference here, what's going to make this more interesting, is that there will be no patenting. All right? There will be no patenting. The agreement it will be that this becomes, goes into the public domain, you know, for the greater good of other scientists as well as industry. Pfizer's going to have no ownership, and, and nor will any of the other companies. And we think that that is a very, very good model, because we're going to get what we need out of it, and we don't have to own it. So there's like one, one example of just, just a, a way to operate that brings the different pieces together and each gets what they need out of it. And I, I would also say we have some of the top, uh, if I, I'm not going to name them because we haven't signed all the agreements yet, but we have the, one of the t two of the, the, the top um, thinkers in the field that are involved with this, so it's going to you know, carry a, a reasonable amount of, uh, of weight. We do have another initiative that, that people may have heard of, which is um, called uh, CTI. Uh, at, uh, at, at Pfizer, and with, what this is about is, is tying in universities in technology centers. So San Diego, Cambridge, um, and, and San Francisco, and, and basically doing cooperative research, but uh, across all the different centers. This is something that just got instituted, um, I think we put this in play over the last one, one, one and a half years. It's difficult to say what the return is going to be on that, but there was a very firm term contracts in such that uh, we were able to do the contracting piece within weeks rather than within, you know, typically what can take months and months and months. So, and I'm happy to talk a little more about that if anybody wants to after the show meeting. Hi, Sandra Soa from Atlantic BioSci. I have a question regarding the small biotech pharma relationship. Uh, actually, two questions. Uh, the first is, is it more common for pharma to license the intellectual property directly from the small biotech, or is it more common to have a co-development of the asset? Um, and if this is a, would be something that's headed into clinical trials, uh, therapeutic. And then the second question is, how much does pharma care about the team at the small biotech? Do you want to see a business person as well as a scientist as well as a legal person? I'll take a crack of that because I'm in the middle now of something like this. I think uh, pharma changing their business model where in the past, as we know, that they can support graduate students or do this, or now actually they want to see if you're going to collaborate with biotech or academia, if you have an intellectual property, and I say it again and again, it's really important because pharma is not going to go and come in to things for biotech and say, oh, we'll take this to develop it, unless you really take it to a certain stage. So what they do usually, and I'm now involved with a small biotech company, we work with them for the last four years. Once you have some data, and then you approach the Merck, the Pfizer, or whatever, and say, look, we have so-and-so, you can do this in meetings or by writing to them, and, and we did. I helped them actually wrote directly to the clinical and the, also the scientific uh, members. So they will want it to come or you to send them to look at it. And at this, they start the ball rolling. They are not going to look at it without signing an agreement. And the biotech will have an agreement with them to look at the data. The second step, they may ask you, 
can we test it in-house? So that means another agreement, and you have to make sure. And if you are shrewd as a biotech company, you say, sure, how about if you give us some fee or something, and there are companies who will give you some fee, and then after they see that this is important, and they listen to the outcome you have, and they verify that, they actually can come into several things, give you milestone, say if you can reach so and so, we can talk about maybe development, licensing, and all this, because the, the farmers not from the beginning gonna commit that they're gonna take it over to develop it, or they're gonna be co-development with you, unless you really have meaningful uh, intellectual information where meet with the company strategy. Some company work in three area, cancer, neurodegeneration, and, and, uh, and, and cardiovascular or whatever. So if you are out of that, there could be opportunities for the company. And sometime they were looking for the same target you have, and they couldn't do it. And believe me, the company I work with, and this is nothing a secret, that was a target we worked on at Wyeth, and Pfizer worked on it. They got nothing out of it. And Merck got nothing, but they got something good as antibody, not a small mm -hmm. molecule. And we did with the small biotech company, something good, active in animal, small molecule, and we have two patent application been filed. So company pharma will salivate over this because it's part of their interest, and they will come and negotiate. But you have to have the intellectual property covered and some of the data for, to whet their appetite. Hi, Mike. Um, Mike, this is for you, Charlie Kamada from NASA. I'm kind of fascinated by your consortium of companies and entrepreneurs that agreed to this no patent arrangement. So I have two parts to one question. Uh, do you find it difficult for people to come into this arrangement? And when they do that, do they fill out um, or sign some sort of non-disclosure agreement? And what I was thinking of that would incentivize folks would be that everyone shares in a patent because it seems like there's no protection for the companies involved. They come up with a discovery, and it's, uh, it's yeah, open so for anyone else to take. And that's an excellent point. Um, and what I would say is that the way the agreements are written, we, we, we wouldn't preclude patenting. If, if, if there were to be patenting, it would be in that sense of the entire group you know, shares in that. Um, so it's, it's certainly not to say, well, you know, no, absolutely not. But the general feeling is that um, in terms of what the professors are really looking for, is they're looking for, they're not really looking to make money off of this. They're looking to maintain their programs. They're looking to expand on their programs. They're looking to open up the door to maybe some other areas of research. Um, so it, it really fits the needs of the specific professors that, that we're engaged with. Um, but I don't believe that we are, and I have to go back and look, but I'm pretty certain we're not precluding that as a, another vehicle that, that, that one could use uh, for, for a particular reason. The more general piece, though, is that, <clears throat> and this just comes back to something that I was saying at, a, at an IS Biotech meeting a couple weeks back, is that, you know, even if Pfizer, if we had the money to finance the whole enchilada, and then we could get it all back for ourselves, in this day and age, is that the right thing to do? Um, now, there's a right thing to do, you know, and you gotta be able to do it and still make sure your, your business model is being supported appropriately. But you know, more and more we're looking at, as long as we have the freedom to operate against these types of things, th that's really all we want. And, and by, by virtue of getting more people involved and then opening it up, you get so much more brain power put to bear. So I, I, think, I, I think I answered your first question. I thought there was a second one in there question was, you know, I tried to determine a way to get people to openly innovate and bring them all together. And so I, I would basically say, hey, everything we do is shared by, by everyone else because I, I, I really believe, well, I was thinking you have to incentivize mm -hmm. somewhat, you know, and I look at, you know, if you don't have a patent, at least you want to protect yourself that someone else doesn't get a patent. And which is where the, a, which is where the disclosure piece me. comes in. Yeah, you got to make sure you get it out in the public domain, you know, so that that doesn't happen. And that's the way around it. 
You know, something that IBM did for years and years and years back in the day. The one other thing I would say is from our perspective, what's, what was what our incentive to give this, to have some really cool stuff and give it up? Because I don't care if somebody else uses it, you know, but I may have a process that's costing me, or, or Pfizer has a process that's costing me $4,000 a kg to make, you know, and we're making metric tons a year, <laughs> and it's killing us. And so uh, suddenly I can have potentially processes that cost me 25 kg per year. That's what my, you know, our incentive is. Usually work from consortium does not lead to intellectual property. If like when they did the genomic consortium with so many companies in order to, to, to really decipher the human genome. So usually when you get involved in a consortium or a group of things, there is no IP. Usually, that's, that's usually the case. It's available for everybody. Question. Typically, when the venture arm of a pharma company, so whether it's Novartis or Pfizer, decides to partner with you, a small biotech, what kind of commitment, real or implied, does it come to use the facilities of the parent pharma venture arm to work with you on manufacturing or assays or whatever else? In other words, is the pharma venture arm only content in giving you money so that you can do work elsewhere, or can it also be partnered in-house with this company? Um, if you want to go first, I can. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say that every flavor is possible, depending on the asset and the strengths and um, deficiencies that each partner potentially brings to the table. It goes back to the earlier question on, you know, do you license? Do you want to license in? Do you want to collaborate? Do you, and you didn't mention it, but or do you want to buy the asset? And there are different cases when any one of those would, would be true. Um, to, to collaborate is a very good thing to do, but also can be an intense labor effort because you get multiple viewpoints on both sides. If you don't clearly, at, before you start the collaboration, if you don't clearly put down the roles and responsibilities and sign off on that, um, many of these collaborations fail, or they, they take much longer to get to a point of success. So, um, you know, whether we collaborate in our labs or your labs, or one company takes on the API, another company takes on the drug product development, or, um, you know, whatever way you're going to divide that up, it's going to be case by case. I'll take a slightly different tact on that. Um, I think the question that I heard was um, if one of the corporate venture funds um, makes an investment in a company, uh, how tied is that um, entrepreneurial company to the mothership of the corporate venture company? So, um, you know, certainly from the Novartis Ventures point of view, um, and I think for most of the corporate venture firms out there, uh, there's a very strict firewall between the venture firm and the research. Um, and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Confidentiality of the, you know, of the proprietary information is, is, is one of the key ones. Um, but basically, uh, these venture companies invest with other venture firms, angels, government funds, um, in, typically in a syndicated deal. So um, in that sense, uh, unless they are able to, and this is, I've never really seen this, negotiate a, a preferential right for their company, they're simply um, treated as financial investors. And um, certainly from Novartis Research, we wouldn't have any special privileges um, with in interacting with the, uh, with the recipient of the investment in, in the company. Does that, I think that kind of answers it. So I, I thought what would be useful, and it hasn't sort of, nobody's asked this question yet, is, uh, is to sort of just go through a little bit about the, the deal process. Um, with an uh, uh, entrepreneurial company or an academic or a small biotech company, because I think there's a few questions and, and, and misunderstandings or, or just sort of clarification needed. Sort of what are the steps that are involved with um, going through uh, sort of to get a deal with a pharma company? Um, certainly, uh, I actually did an analysis for Novartis research, um, um, a strategic meeting we had a couple of weeks ago, so it was fairly timely. Um, but we looked at the number of low molecular weight, uh, chemistry discovery, technology platform deals, Novartis, and uh, peer companies, 
um, pharma companies did in 2011, 12, and 13. And uh, the numbers are uh, not very large. Uh, Novartis did two, I think Pfizer two or three. Uh, most of the companies were sub four, and that's deals in this space for over two or three years. Uh, other companies like AstraZeneca did 11 or 12. Um, so there are certainly companies which are, uh, as you can tell from you know, what we read in the press, um, focusing more on externalizing research and accessing external technology. But these numbers, you know, uh, as the VCs will also say, uh, they're, they're, they're astoundingly low. And the number of biotechs, say, uh, in San Diego alone is sort of five or 600. Um, yet we might do one or two deals in the, from the entire world of, 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 um, of biotechnology. And uh, um, so I just sort of wanted to um, sort of walk people through and sort of maybe um, express some of the decision points and, uh, and how it goes in our companies. So basically, uh, uh, the, the, the idea or the concept uh, or the question can come in from anywhere. Um, often, uh, a scientist will be at a, at, a, at a conference. It's kind of a common way. And he says, I got a business card from a company with a platform uh, technology in our area. Uh, I'm not the specialist in the, involved in this. You know, can this be analyzed? So it comes to, in Novartis, what we call strategic alliances. And uh, we will um, go to the, the, the right expert in our company for an analysis. Um, there's typically an initial teleconference. Um, it's very rare that we start with a meeting um, to basically review non-confidential slides, discuss the technology in principle. If there's interest, uh, then there would be a wider follow-up meeting, sometimes in person. Um, but basically, there'll be more stakeholders and more uh, people who would be relevant to uh, the technology uh, and who might use it and, and can sort of probe further questions. Um, that's often followed, if that's um, still of interest, uh, a confidential meeting. And pharma companies, it, a lot of people ask us right away to go into a CDA. It's very rare that pharma companies would like to do that. We see so many opportunities and we have so much, so much research going on that actually overlaps with what's going on in the outside world that we don't want to contaminate our efforts by hearing con confidential information. So never be offended if you don't immediately get acceptance of your CDA request. It's just uh, how the business works. Um, we will often do, if the confidential review went well and we'd still like the data and, and, and it's very compelling, um, we'll often uh, enter into an MTA agreement um, where we access the technology platform or receive the compounds or the building blocks uh, to uh, basically see do, do the test. Does this work as advertised? Um, we see a lot of op opportunities come in that um, don't actually pan out in our hands. And you know, we have to go back to the investigators and say, can you show us how this works? Um, sometimes it, 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 the, the platforms aren't that robust. Uh, so we uh, almost always do uh, an evaluation. Uh, and then if that all goes well, then basically what happens to get a deal done, we actually then, uh, as the business people in our organization, we have to create an internal pitch to our management. So you, know, you pitch it to us, but then we have uh, we have to create an extremely compelling story to pitch to our management to access a large amount of, you know, of money that you know, could be spent on many other projects that advance healthcare and uh, for treating unmet medical need. We have to prove that this is the best way our company can spend its money uh, to, uh, to improve how it, how it works. Um, we have internal stakeholder management. We have to essentially lobby and, uh, and convince. Um, so we become internal entrepreneurs essentially for the opportunity once it's reached that threshold of, uh, you know, we, we're interested, we think this works. Um, there's management review, approval. We uh, um, uh, basically have to get a leadership sign off. Um, and then following that, then there's basically a negotiation, a deep due diligence, contracting, uh, and execution. That whole process can, you know, typically takes nine months um, from the initial conversation through to the testing. It can take two years, uh, three years even. Um, very compelling cases. It can happen in a couple of weeks, um, but that's typically if, if leadership is brought in at a very early stage. So I just wanted to throw that out there because I think that was almost one of the most valuable things that I could bring to this group. Um, I think we're almost out of time, but. Uh, you know, I'd just like to throw that to Maggie and, and Mike to say, do you have additional thoughts or, or comments or vignettes even that you might want to share with the audience to help them sort of understand that, that part of the process?
Well, the, the deal is, yeah, the, you mentioned the steps which take all that long, but also f from my practical experience, usually the deals could be made also by communicating with the, with the key individual and then let the process after that take its, its, uh, its place. I mean, the, an example of that, the two big deals I made, one in Pharma and one at Temple. And in Pharma, when I made an agreement in India for 150 sciences to work for Wyeth, and I went myself there and we talked, and, and first, of course, I was uh, doing pilot studies and things. Then I mentioned to this, the CEO of the company, when we were talking about, in the bottom line, how much it's gonna cost me. And he mentioned the price. And I said, this is non-starter, because to do that, I have to go back and lay off 40 chemists. So it's non-starter. And then before actually I take the plane back, he actually asked me well, how much you think per chemist, and I gave him my peace of mind. And then by the time I landed, he called me and said, let's start the process. So we actually worked through the process which was mentioned, and, uh, and of course you get the contract, you get the agreement, and, and so on. Same thing in academia, when you wanna access platform technology, and I wanna do that, some informatic and some bioinformatic. And when I was in pharma, we paid dearly, we paid a few hundred thousand a year to get those as license. And I actually talked to the CEO, and he came and visited us, and so on, and I'm not going to disclose how much it is, but believe me, we paid a fraction of license, and I gave him in return that he can publicize that our center use his technology, and also when I gave presentation, I will give them PR in my presentation. And that was the interaction between us, and then we let the process go through the tech transfer and others. And so I would say the personal engagement is important if you can do it, because that can facilitate the rest of the all the steps. Mike, any comments or? or Just uh, one or two quick comments. So uh, what Avi, Avi described uh, is, I, I think, um, pretty much very similar to the type of process we use, and probably most of farmer uses a process similar to that. Uh, a comment in two places, the beginning, you know, where things come from, they come from everywhere. And in times in our organization where we're incubating our own assets, we may be the one that's, that's pushing that out. I'd like to re you know, emphasize the, the comment on the CDA that although it might seem like you're being rebuffed, um, by putting a CDA in place so that we're hearing confidential information and maybe you're hearing confidential information, that actually can be a problem in terms of contaminating people's thought processes if you already have similar programs going on. So it's very, very important. Um, one of the ways we can get around that sometimes is we go into a clean room. All right, so we're doing a lot more electronic due diligences now. Um, and a, a component of that could be a clean room where basically everything's going into a clean room and it's going to be assessed by um, uh, sort of almost like a third party, maybe a third party within the company or, or someplace else. They're disseminating the information and bringing it back. That sort of gives sort of a, a, a bit of a firewall. And those are the only things I would add, but I think it's a, it's, it's a pretty good okay. process that it was described. So we are almost, well, we're, we're over time, but uh, I'm going to ask Kenny to indulge me for some uh, closing remarks from the panel. So I'm going to uh, start off so I can give sort of Megid and Mike a, a few moments to think if they have any sort of final words of, of wisdom that they want to share. Um, I just uh, um, sort of having been involved in business development and licensing in Novartis now for essentially nine and a half years, um, the, I think there are two items that really keep coming up that I really want to share and that is um, we, you know, Novartis, you know, we have, say, 12,000 people in research. I'm not sure of the exact numbers. Um, but um, people on, you know, on the outside world, they have to realize there's sort of 12,000 people. They're all doing, working about 125% capacity of what they can possibly do in the hours in the daytime. Um, so when we sort of uh, um, encounter new opportunities on the outside world, and it's an idea, it's early stage. Um, it needs some extra experimentation done before we can really assess, you know, have, have, has this group figured it out? Have they come across something uh, phenomenal? Um, it's, uh, it's really rare that uh, we have people free and uh, willing and uh, have time and resources to actually say, oh sure, yeah, I could, I could run that animal model, I could run that test, I can make that compound, I can make the polymer and uh, bring it in house and test it and see if it really works as advertised. Um, 
So, so my advice on that front is basically um, to try and advance um, as much as you can the, the, just the early stage experiments that don't necessarily cost so much, but not to expect us to try and um, prove the concept of the uh, technology that you're presenting to us. Try and come to us with that. And then the sub bullet point to that is feel free to ask us what are the key pieces of information that we would like to see on that technology that actually make it a really compelling opportunity to us. That can save a lot of time and experimentation. And um, the uh, um, actually forgot I did a <laughs> like a presidential debate moment. I'll come back to my, my second comment. <laughs> Mike, I'll go to, I'll go to you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go a little bit tangential for, for just a second. Um, the world's a really, I mean, we, this is kind of almost naive to say this, but you know, we all understand this, but the, the world of strategic alliances, of academic uh, industry and industry and industry partnerships has been turned upside down in the last, uh, in the last five years. And the science of technology that's out there, it, it's in some of the strangest places that you could ever imagine, you know, and, and there are rocks that even haven't been, you know, overturned at this point in time. Somebody from Addis Ababa, you know, could send me a text today and say, you know, we're doing this thing on data integration and I've been using uh, my iPhone and, and, and using the cloud and doing computing work and uh, Amazon.com and, you know, here's some, it's, it's a strange, strange world now. And I think we have to understand that Sometimes the old models aren't going to be the right models, that we've got to continue to be thinking forward and ahead. Think non-traditionally, I would really encourage that. There's a lot of ways to get your good idea to somebody that it's even a better idea to them and, and may be able to help you out. Um, think out of the box. And, you know, that's just this, the thing that I've learned in the three years that I've been in the, in, in the role that I'm in is that there's almost always a way to get it done if you're going to benefit or profit, you know, in some way or another from getting it done. So. Thanks. Yeah, I would uh, add to that, say that if you are passionate about your idea and your niche, I mean, be persistent and in order to, and approaching people and try to get that through networking, through ACS, through any colleagues, but be persistent. But in the meantime, try to be flexible in terms of negotiation, because sometimes you start and then things will grow and will grow and grow. So try to uh, be also flexible. And uh, I would say that always you start small and, and you'll end up actually uh, before you imagine that uh, the business is growing and multi-partner and so on. But the time is right now for collaboration and partnership. Thanks, Mahid. And uh, my second point, if I may, uh, Kenny, is uh, um, I would encourage uh, all the entrepreneurs out there to really know your competition. Um, we see time and time again uh, pitches come in where basically, you know, we've solved this route for drug discovery. Uh, this is the only thing you'll need for your entire future of research. Um, and, you know, in reality, uh, it's uh, it's uh, a technology, it's in a field, uh, there's plenty of competition there, there's some biotech companies, there's academic work, um, and as pharma companies, you know, we pretty much get to see almost all of it, and then we have to weigh it up, and we have to um, uh, convince our management of the advantages of one technology over another. And it's really helpful if the entrepreneurs who know their field better than anyone, better than us, um, have actually done that in advance and can say, these are the other technologies that you could uh, use to solve this problem. This is why we're different. This is the benefit. And, uh, you know, if you're trying to do this, then, um, you know, we're the people to talk to. And really know that and make that case compelling. Because I'd say probably only about 5% of slide decks we see have that up front. And then we have to ask for it and find it out. So I'd really encourage you to do that. Um, so just in conclusion, um, thank you for participating. Thank you to the organizers for having us. Um, and you know, good luck, change the world, and remember that you know, we're here to help. Um, we want your success as much as you do because that basically adds to what we can bring to the, the market as well. So good luck. <laughs>